Okay, so we're ready to start, I think, again. Um, it's my uh, uh, privilege to uh, welcome you back to our program on the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg Medical Trial, um, and to introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Paul Windling, um, who's a research professor at Oxford Brookes University in the UK. Uh, he co-directs uh, research on victims of brain research, as held by the Max Planck Institutes for Brain Research, Psychiatry, uh, and Neurology. He's co-president of the Commission to Research the Medical Faculty of the Reich University at Strasbourg um, uh, during the early 40s and he's researching the provenance of the history of brains that were taken primarily from Polish Jews uh, by uh, Germans during the, uh, during the war. Um, he uh, is the author of multiple books on um, uh, medicine and uh, genocide, medicine and the Holocaust, medicine and um, Nazi uh, experimentation, um, and written countless uh, articles, um, and I'm sure is going to enlighten us all. Uh, please join us on welcoming uh, Professor Windling to the podium. Thank you. So thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Above all, thank you for, the, um, for inviting me and bringing me over here. Um, I, I think history is a natural partner with bioethics. It provides an evidence base for bioethics. In this case, it provides a worst case scenario in terms of the doings of Nazi doctors, and then at the trial, uh, which I agree is a momentous occasion, which deserves um, full commemoration, um, how these misdeeds were perceived. Um, oh, I need to... I'm going to have to go forward, I hope, because I don't have a a paper. I speak freely. Um, so the medical case was unique at Nuremberg. Uh, why? Firstly, there was victim evidence. Secondly, it is not just a legal trial. It's an ethics discourse. And the judges switch on occasions and ask the defendants, the prosecution, and witnesses for an ethics opinion. It's as if they suspend the legal proceedings and they want to have a retrospective view on what went on under National Socialism. Um, it's important also because it is the one of the many Nuremberg trials which ends with a declaration. And this declaration is on what was called voluntary consent. It's not yet informed consent. There are differences. Um, one might argue that there is greater um, agency with a voluntary consent. And we know that this declaration in 1963, I haven't found an earlier mention, becomes known as the Nuremberg Code. So clearly something is going on in the 1960s with a, genera a new generation of bioethicists, Irving and Latimer, particularly pick up on the trial. And, um, the, and that is to direct attention to what is a permissible medical experiment and its correct conduct. Um, we know that the German medicine was very research-oriented. We've heard that from... Shelley uh, Rubenfeld in particular. Um, but, and if you want to have the doctor title, and that's still today, you have to do a research thesis. And it's a serious thesis, and it's published. Um, but Nazi coerced, so the question arises. At the time of the trial, the Nazi research was often characterized as pseudoscience. But over time, 
the conduct of the um, the research has been viewed as more seriously scientific in terms of the rationales of the research, that there is a scientific core. Now, it can be also that that fits in to a broader Nazi racial agenda. So one needs to put the two sides together. Um, but And then you get also a, a very good case for the exploitation of, for research of devalued lives. And here I will also address the case of, of Josef Mengele, about whom we've already heard. I would like, in this talk, to build bridges to the Holocaust. There is another approach to the trial, which is just to focus on the internal proceedings in the courtroom, as if it was just um, the, um, the legal principles which had to come through military law. It was a military trial uh, generated the, um, the, the proceedings. But um, I think there was a pre-trial process when uh, prisoner physicians and also um, um, the actual prisoners themselves came forward and alerted um, the, um, I can say, the legal teams working on the case to all sorts of medical atrocities. Um, and this declaration, 4th of March 1945, by the prisoner doctors of Auschwitz, is really far-sighted. Um, prisoners have been treated as experimental animals. The allies and neutral states to bring to trial those responsible. Well, it was in fact just the allied states, and in particular it was the Amer it was an America in the end it was an American military trial. Um, but prosecuting perpetrators to prevent human it's to prevent coerced human experiments and medical atrocities in the future. So it in it <laughs> I could say there was a perceived need to recalibrate medicine, to readjust medicine. And that we can see already, it's very early, 4th of March, 45, um, before the war had ended, before there were any, before there was even the four power Nuremberg trial. Um, and we can find similar declarations and similar searches for victim compensation in, from other concentration camps. From Dachau, for example, they were collecting prisoners themselves, after liberation, collect evidence. So I think there's already there important agency. It doesn't come totally from above. Above, you might say, the military authorities and military um, intelligence services and war crimes and war crimes investigators, they have to, have, they have to listen, but, which they did. So it's to their credit as well. So we can see pressure coming from below. Um, so why is there? Why, why was there a medical trial? We know the four-power trial um, against the major Nazi politicians and financiers had ended. And then the question arose, should there be a second four-power trial? The problem there was, if there was going to be a second inter-allied trial, it would be in uh, Soviet-occupied Berlin. And that was already perceived as a, a major problem, putting a trial against financiers in Berlin. The fear was it would become a, a Russian propaganda trial. And there was already the embarrassment of the um, the Soviets shifting responsibility for the murder of Polish officers at Katyn, for example, Shif shifting this murder, which the Soviets had conducted, onto the Germans. So the, 
Western allies wanted to avoid such an embarrassing situation. Um, it was also, they thought, a medical trial dealing with human experiments would really involve hands-on murder. It would be a fairly simple sort of trial to conduct and clear-cut. Well, here there was an underestimation of the um, very tough German defense of their conduct. Um, and, but certainly at that time, there was a large body of evidence being, con being brought together by the um, Allied intelligent, Western Allied intelligence officers who were drafted in to collect evidence of German scientific achievements, but in fact, they were quite clued up. And they saw, well, these scientific achievements actually involve mass murder, genocide, and uh, un clearly unethical experimentation. So they shifted on from a rather naive military agenda um, to, uh, the expectation was new weaponry and things like that, onto the criminality of Germany, in particular of German medicine. Um, well, what themes are there? Um, so, medical research and experiments were really crimes against humanity. We know that's a new concept that comes forward in Nuremberg. And another new concept is that of Raphael Lemkin's concept of genocide. So those are very much present. There's, it's also recognized that medicine, as we've heard, is a key component of the Nazi racial state. The prosecution, though, bring in not just physicians, they bring in some senior SS administrators in order to uh, how can I say, cement the link with the Nazi state. So it's not just doctors, it's certain SS officers who order things like um, Victor Brack ordered the, um, the radiation experiments, which were seen as a way of uh, um, rapid mass, mass sterilization. That was the aim, these, these awful radiation experiments in Auschwitz. Um, and so doctors are there, they're prosecuted as agents of war and killing racial undesirables. And Karl Brandt, who's the doctor who's always mentioned first, it's really just alphabetical, incidental, but he had certainly a senior position, not only in the imposition of um, Nazi euthanasia policies, the killing of psychiatric patients, but um, also in the whole, as the war went on, as general commissioner for sanitary and health, is, uh, sanitary and health matters. It has the trial, one shouldn't um, underestimate the legal thought that goes into such a trial. As far as I can see, there's um, Sheldon Gluck, the idea of the Germans waging aggressive war philosopher Franz Neumann, who writes a book, Behemot, the against the Nazi debasing of legal and rational structures, resulting in the pseudoscience of coerced experiments. Herr Schlauterpacht, with his concept of crimes against humanity, and Raphael Lemkin, this new term from 1944 of physicians. And he talks about physicians as professional genocidists. Seems an odd term, but um, it's, a, I think, a very interesting term. And specific for the medical case, there is a um, John Thompson. He was involved in one of these allied medical intelligence unit, inter-allied British-American. He has a mixed Mexican and Canadian identity, a complicated person. Uh, he uses this term medical war crimes. I think that's important of bridging the conduct of medicine 
with the criminality in this post-war phase, and Andrew Ivey, a physiologist who presses from Chicago, um, expert on um, digestion, uh, the violations of the Hippocratic Oath, the violations of the Hippocratic Essex of experiments. So there's, there is a lot going on in the courtroom. Oops, I need to go back one. Um, so beyond the courtroom is the idea that the victims have agency. These experiments, mainly in concentration camps, but also in clinics, see, for example, for brain research, um, there were protests, there was resistance, there was sabotage. We talk about the, um, the freezing water experiments. The uh, thermostats were sabotaged. The water wasn't as cold as <laughs> the experimenters thought, for example, because there were prisoner assistants, and the prisoner assistants also have a very interesting interesting role um, i will mention some abuses of the ethics of consent uh, but there is also but certainly we find protest resistance evasion and very interesting post war testimonies and we find that all with joseph mengele he didn't have such an easy time as one might think and so I think if we can take a victim's point of view and victim testimony, that provides an additional dimension at the trial. Uh, this John Thompson, as I said, obscure person, but um, I spent some time reconstructing his biography. Um, and um, he was, he said, no, we have to look at German clinics and universities as major, um, as having a major role in Nazi experimentation it was absolutely right. A picture by the Armenian photographer Kash. Um, and he says, in the course of investigating research work in Germany, he comes across a deeply disturbing problem. He says that. There's the use of humans as experimental subjects, which is widespread in German academia. And he says, unless this is fully investigated and uh, I could say called out, this will undermine the future of medical practice throughout Germany and more widely. So he, I think, has an important role in the um, sets. He's on the edges of Nuremberg. So he proposed comprehensive documentation in all Nazi unethical experiments. I was very interested in finding a meeting between the French, British, US at the Pasteur Institute in France. And I thought, God, this is end of July, beginning of August, 1946. Well, here we have a code of medical experimentation, but we haven't had the trial yet. So um, it's not as well developed as the actual, um, as, as the actual principles, but still it was an important stage and shows that we're already uh, bioethical agendas that were already motivating the organizing of the trial. And this Thompson run uh, has this International Scientific Commission on War Crimes with the aim of documenting all medical experiments because the, because in a single trial, you it has to be selective. And it's partly who is around, who one happens to have arrested. Uh, Mengele, we know, slipped through the net. Um, so that um, he's, he says, well, we must be absolutely comprehensive. Uh, and I think that's important. And that, for me, was a cue for 
a complete reconstruction of all Nazi experiments and their victims, as far as that's possible. Um, so we know that there were various stages before informed, on informed consent. We know that there are these 1931 Reich Health Council regulations. Um, there are various inter-allied meetings on unethical medical experiments in Germany and then on the, the Pasteur Institute. And we know 1st of November 1946, the physiologist Andrew Ivey is sent to Nuremberg by the um, uh, war crimes um, authorities of the US. He's sent from Washington to Nuremberg um, as an expert on the history of medical experimentation. And so a lot goes on before the trial begins in December 1946. Um, and this is his um, outline of principles and rules of experimentation. And we can see already consent of the subject is required. Only volunteers should be used. So I think from that point of view, Ivy is a comprehensive figure. Um, I know that uh, not everyone is keen on Ivy, but he has, he brings an ethical agenda for the reconstruction of medicine to the trial before the trial takes place. So I think, and that's why there is this dual bioethical and criminal um, uh, discourses run parallel at the trial. Um, and um, interesting um, restrictions on this conduct of medical experimentation. Scientific qualifications are important no unnecessary suffering, and there shouldn't be death or disabling injury. Which, um, obvious, but not to the Germans in Auschwitz. Um, and um, what the Allies did, what the Americans did, was to call for victims to come forward. And there were broadcasts on the radio in Germany and Czechoslovakia and Poland come and give evidence at the trial, come forward, we, you know, we, we need you. So that um, in this case, this is a comment by another medical expert at the trial, Leo Alexander, a neurologist. A neurologist with, uh, I think, a fairly uh, deep psychological insight into issues like the philosophy of consent. Um, and... Um, here he greets the arrival of um, an Auschwitz X-ray sterilization victim who is clearly very severely mutilated. Because what we know is that um, not only did these, did these um, X-rays cause severe burns, but the testicles were extracted. And um, the testicles... I think it's very important to know what happened to the body parts of prisoners. They apparently went to Rotslav, to the Breslau, to the um, Pathology Institute. And interestingly enough, the Pathology Institute in Breslau is a one institute that does not open its doors <laughs> to a non-Polish pathologist. That's a problem. Um, but you can find specimens um, in other locations, not of this particular experiment, but for example, brains. So specimens are stable, they're preserved, and scientific collections need to be carefully evaluated, which is what we had to do in, in Strasbourg, for example, when we were looking at the Reich University and the misdeeds of certain members of the university, like um, August Hirt, who ordered 86 Jews to be transferred from Auschwitz. They were gassed in a nearby concentration camp of Neuengamme, and then the bodies are found in the cellar of the anatomical institute in storage tanks. Storage tanks still exist today, actually. Um, so it's a historic building, and the 
University of Strasbourg is at last thinking how to take responsibility and commemorate because it had previously shifted all the responsibility onto the Germans. Um, but it's, uh, I, I think he's very insightful, Leo Alexander. And this level of insight is, and the sympathy for the victims recurs time and time again at the trial. Now, these are the, um, the um, defendants, the, perp the accused perpetrators. And I've arranged them uh, by age, by date of birth. So we can see we're going from senior professors or senior military physician, like Handloser, to um, um, by age to very young assistants. Hetta Oberhäuser, the one woman who assisted Karl Gephardt for the tetanus experiments in Ravensbrück. What we see here is that the generation who were most responsible is the, gener is the generation in the middle. Um, you could, if we look at the death sentences, you can see that between, if you were born between 1896 and um, Sievers 1905, uh, there's Rudolf Brandt as well then comes. But those are the SS members, and those are the ones who received death sentences, which were carried out. It was a, a tough trial. Um, the accused, if we look at their uh, universities where they studied, uh, we can see that um, most of the doctors had academic status, um, which is an argument against just pseudoscience. And most were at the University of Berlin, a couple uh, had qualified originally in Munich, and one uh, uh, called Beigelberg, relatively young, um, was from Vienna. Um, Beigelberg was accused of working in collaboration with a more senior figure, Hans Eppinger, who was a noted internist. And Eppinger, a few weeks before the trial, commits suicide. So that's another piece of fallout that occurs. Um, there's a very, um, I can say, moving and I think vivid um, um, opening address by Brigadier Telford Taylor. And he says, well, they are the nameless dead. I think we can name. I'm absolutely sure of that. But this bringing in batches of victims is something that definitely went on. They were indifferent to uh, who, who the, when victim groups were selected for experiments, there was an indifference uh, to who they were. Uh, for example, taking, um, I'll use the term gypsies here, we can use the term gypsies in England, the Germans don't like the equivalent, but um, so the survivors of the liquidation of the gypsy camp were then used for seawater drinking experiments in the concentration camp of Dachau. Um, and as I say, this issue of Ivy and the legalized code of ethics runs through the trial, which is in a way, you can see why the judges picked up on that, because they were themselves under pressure to formulate some form of declaration at the end of the trial. And Ivy reappears, he comes and goes from Nuremberg. Um, and I think, he, from that point of view, he has a significant point of view. Um, there are four charges, common design of conspiracy. That fails, interestingly enough. So it's not really top-down. There were multiple sets of experiments. Yes, some needed to be approved by Himmler, though not all. Uh, there's no approval of Josef Mengele, for example. Mengele improvises his experiments in 
Auschwitz itself with the approval of the commandant as a reward for conducting these murderous, genocidal selections on the ramp in Auschwitz about which we have heard. So that um, he's given the, uh, he's allocated resources for the twin block, for example. Um, and um, so there's, it's a war crimes trial, crimes against humanity. And again, the one charge that was automatically um, um, sustained was a membership of the SS as a criminal organization. That comes out of the precursor full, tri full power trial. And what they did at the trial was to conduct hierarchies in order basically to show um, even if you are a junior physician, like Fritz Fischer, like Hertha Oberhäuser, there were two more junior physicians who were involved in the tetanus experiments, wounding the legs of um, self-styled um, Polish women prisoners, the so-called rabbits of Auschwitz. They called, they called themselves the rabbits. So that's how they felt they were being abused. And... Um, the so that they there were links made in a single um, a single structure and links also to figures who had committed suicide like uh, Gravitz for example. Um, these are the defence lawyers. They were very tough, and a number of them had already been in court for the four power trial. And in a way, the new wave of US prosecutors, they were good, but they met tough. These, the, these, these lawyers, uh, many of whom were in the Nazi party, that's the final column, you can see the number of Nazis among them, or former Nazis. Um, they provided tough opposition in the courtroom. Um, and it was a sign of the, the U.S. authorities wanting to be absolutely fair, to give every defendant a, um, a good chance to put, to put their case. So, as I said, we have, on the one hand, an international trial, the consequences of aggressive war, and on the other hand, we have an ethics tribunal, which I think is the interest, which is an interesting side for us, and these issues of the validity of research and the consent of the research subjects are there from the beginning and run through, which is I can understand a bioethicist wanting to read the complete trial. <laughs> it is a fascinating document. Um, so. There are also, in an effort to show the fairness of the trial, there were German medical observers. There was a German medical delegation. Uh, Alexander Mitchellich, and he had uh, an assistant there, and also Alice platen Hallemund, a young psychiatrist who'd actually dropped out of German psychiatry because she saw how horrific it was and went to Italy and then came back as a country doctor when she had to during the war. Um, and they did a pretty good job, I think. Mitchell is Mitchell is focusing on the scientization, the experimental science uh, in medicine. That was his his concern. Um, and Alice platen Hallamont did the um, first, did, I think it's the second account of the Nazi killing of psychiatric patients. Um, an important analysis on not only this trial, but a trial in, in Frankfurt. Um, so we already have, as a defense, these German regulations on new therapy and human experiments, um, and on limitations, for example, no experimentation involving dying subjects. Um, no experimentation on young persons under 18 if it endangers the child. Well, we know that that 
was ignored by Mengele. Um, and we know that here we have Leo Alexander, the well-known photograph, demonstrating the really horrific and deep leg wounds that were a precursor that, um, from which four of the Polish guinea pigs actually died. Um, and there were also protests in the camp, protests to prevent them, with the other solidarity with other prisoners in the camp to prevent the Germans from killing the, the victims and removing them as evidence. Uh, and we know that they had also initially protested as a violation of their rights in the camp. So very articulate protest. So prisoners have a sense of rights. I think that's important. Um, we know that there is <laughs> the ethical discourse builds up. They send um, uh, memoranda to the judges, um, in, informed consent, enlightened consent, voluntary consent. There are a lot of different formulations um, which are being used. And then the, one of the judges, Judge Sebring, um, adds something which is really important, which is the autonomy of the research subject. And yeah, Ivy, it said that there was some perjury regarding the um, experiments in US penitentiaries, but he has a, a higher agenda. I accepted the invitation to serve at the Nuremberg trials only because I had in mind the objective of placing human beings uh, who may serve as subjects in a medical experiment so that these conditions would become the international common law on the subject. Yeah, it was necessary. Um, here I have, and this is another very original aspect of the trial, the fact that prisoners, victims of experiments, give evidence in court. That's really, I think, uh, and so it's not just documents. We have the experimental subject is um, uh, provides, for example, Maria Kuzmichuk. Um, the so I've highlighted the different victims, um, and they talk about their experiences of experiments. And there's one of them. It's very dramatic. Karl Hohenreiner. He's is asked to identify the doctor who conducted the experiments, that's Wilhelm Weigelberg, the Austrian. So what does he do? He punches Weigelberg. That's his reaction in court. So the court is a, it's very dramatic, I think. It's not just reading evidence into, into the trial transcripts. And there is a sympathetic analysis by Leo Alexander, who is the expert witness to the prosecution, um, about an anxiety tension reaction. Um, he, uh, he was provoked by the, by the defense lawyer in a derogatory comment about gypsies. So that also has to be figured in. Um, but the court had no choice other than to um, um, impose a period of detention on Alan Reiner. Um, but it's done with, I think, sympathy. Correct, but sympathetic. Um, cases are well constructed. For example, the euthanasia case. There's a Czech lawyer, there's also a German name, but he appears there as Holy. Orlik Hochfeldt, um, and um, he constructs a case linking euthanasia to genocide by focusing on selection of prisoners from concentration camps. It's a very well done and successful 
part of the part of the case. Um, so it's the I think both sides deserve a, um, acknowledgement that this is this is hard fought and at a high level of um, so it's all these proceedings I've tried to give a little sort of some background in the judgment on permissible medical experiments which we have the text outside which I think so I won't repeat it but we have the voluntary consent of the subject was the phrasing decided on um, and we can see the different elements to it but what comes in from the judges is the subject is at liberty to end the experiment and the scientist is obliged to end the experiment when there are injuries and death so that that was the I could say the contribution of the judges and otherwise I've given there are multiple versions of the code that develop at Nuremberg um, it sometimes said that it wasn't known, but for a very long time that there was this um, code of the judges. I don't think that's right, because there's publicity for the judgment. There's a text in publication on the Nuremberg Military Tribunals. And it's also the neurologist Alexander Mitchelly in the book, um, this, um, science, it's called initially not medicine without humanity, but science without humanity on um, permissible medical experiments. And the New World Medical Association takes it up. So this declaration on permissible experiments is definitely in circulation and it's then developing. Um, I think a key issue is then the constellate is the crystallization of bioethics, and it's in that book, which by um, Ladimar and Newman in 1963, I think 63, that Ivy is congratulated, and then Nuremberg, the significance of the judicial declaration then it's called the Nuremberg Code for the first time. So we have a code being un unleashed in, I think, a new um, how can I say, set of circumstances where bioethics is regarded as having an important identity and role within the um, legal um, framework of, the, of American medicine. So Ivy writes to the authors of the book, the judges and I were determined that something of a preventative nature had to come out of the trial of medical atrocities, handling patients as though they had no sacred or inalienable rights will negate the good end or reason for the medical profession in society. And so we can see the declaration of the prisoner doctors of Auschwitz being fulfilled in that sense by the trial. I think the trial from that point of view is significant and really important. And um, I, that's where I hope that this perspective is one which is interesting t to you all. And uh, it's there that I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a, an extraordinary presentation. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned the fact that each one of the accused was provided with legal defense. Yeah. What were the arguments of the lawyers defending the accused? So I'm interested in knowing whether their case was essentially procedural in nature, mm 
or whether there was any particular moral content that okay. they brought up in defending the accused? Um, I mean, there were a variety of arguments, a little bit de dependent on the different, <laughs> different lawyers, their interpretation of German law. Um, because in one sense, it was said, this is war. What we did, this acting under orders, it was necessary what we were doing, providing vaccines for the German army. Um, this was dangerous research, but necessary. And the, if we look at the structure of Nazi medical experiments, it's in, they're at a relatively low level. And in 1942, uh, 41, 42, so once there is the Barbarossa campaign against Russia, the numbers of experiments really are astronomical. And they remain at a high level right to the end of the war. So as Shelley said, there are 30,000 roughly. I count them all individually um, in order to build up a, a composite picture of the, exper of the experiments over time. Uh, the, we can see that um, there is the wartime circumstances are certainly very important. Other arguments, though, were based on the care that was taken, um, rather ignoring the fact that a doctor like Beigelberg was experimenting using a pistol, <laughs> actually, to <laughs> threaten his users. So we learn a great deal about the actual conduct of the experiments and how the, uh, the experimenter achieved his, or in the case of Oberhäuser, her ends. Um, but it's a, a great deal is about duty. And they were performing a duty in the context of, um, I can say, a total, total war. Thank you for that very thorough uh, presentation. I'm curious if you have uh, reflections on the interactions between the tribunal judges and the both the defense lawyers as well as the prosecution lawyers. How much interaction was there outside of the courtroom between these very powerful entities that were at play within the drama, as you describe it, the drama, the theater of the courtroom itself? Okay. We know that the way the uh, the day-to-day -day housing of the um, the prosecuting lawyers and the judges there was a lot of interaction, and there is some um, I couldn't say correspondence, uh, messages, memoranda has survived. The between the judges and the defence lawyers, I think much less in this trial, less than in other trials but still there were the court proceedings. And the judges gave voice to the defense lawyers as well. They would ask both sides, what do you think in these particular circumstances? As they do this for the seawater drinking, for example. The judges want a legal opinion on the experiment. I mean, they want a medical opinion, sorry, a medical opinion on the experiments, the quality of the experiments, uh, so yeah, that's that's. Um, I would say it. they're doing they're doing their work from that point of view, but they do they certainly felt that partly their criteria for sentencing, and partly, which is one reason for this initial declaration, but also they were persuaded that post-war medicine needed a declaration, something had to come out of, out of their work. So they were listening. I mean, they, for the most part, it was a, a listening brief. But in the course of the trial, memoranda were drafted and sent to the judges as well. So there is background communication. It's not just what goes on in court. It's outside court. It's outside quarters as well, really. And they were very hard-working judges, I think. Um, 
the uh, one can see that, for example, the um, the chair of the tribunal, he he uh, Beals, he read Lemkin, for example. He briefs himself. He's very interested in German culture. Um, Sebring, they were not Supreme Court justices. They were state. They were state just. They were state justices, and in this case, they were. I think they work very well. In some of the other um, prosecutors, there were problems of naivety, sympathy with the um, with the defendants. They were just uh, conscientious industrialists and so on. But in this case, I think we have a, a very well-run case, well thought through, with these ethical themes running from start to finish. It wasn't just right at the end. Unfortunately, for the four-power trial, we have at least one judge's diary. We have nothing like that. Um, Sebring has got a small collection in, I think, Potsdam, Florida. Um, but um, it's, there is not a lot left from the, um, from the judges. We've uh, we've heard uh, several times the um, intimation that the experiments were um, not well conducted, that they were pseudoscience, etc. Okay. Um, to to what extent do you think that um, part of that is a kind of presentism? Because even the standard of randomized cl uh, controlled trials that we use now um, wasn't even invented until um, um, after the war, um, and um, and so I'd, I'd like you to sort of uh, say more about whether the kind of experimentation that was being done um, uh, was you know, of the same quality that um, people were doing in the United States or the UK um, at, the, at the time. Okay. Um, we know that for some experiments there were the comparative groups. I mean, again, seawater drinking. So they are the... They're different groups subjected to different mixtures of seawater and some neutralizing subjects. So it's certainly comparative. The Those who are chosen, it is, you might say it's randomized, but I don't know whether it fulfills the criteria strictly. I mean, they're, they're just divided up. You go in that, you go there, you go there. Um, so that, um, and we know that for the immunization experiments, again, for example, the experiments in Buchenwald, the different groups with the different results, um, there was a journal in the, uh, there was an article in the journal on hygiene, Zeitschrift für Hygiene. That article was take, was reprinted in the Lancet with the comment that these must be deadly experiments. The Lancet could read the German article and see that they published um, on, and when it referred to the deaths, ex experiments that were resulting in death. What the Lancet didn't know is who were the victims? Uh, could they be prisoners of, could they be allied prisoners of war? Well, we know that they weren't, but we do know who the victims were. Um, who, which was uh, different nationalities of prisoners in the concentration camp of Buchenwald, with one criteria, very few were Jewish. They didn't want Jews in the experimental block. So there was one of the, one of the when they found out one of the prisoners was Jewish, he was kicked out, and he says, gosh, he was pleased he was kicked out, because they were dan it was dangerous experimentation. Um, live vaccines were sometimes used. Um, but again, the experiments vary in danger. The seawater drinking, for example, were acutely painful over a longer period of uh, 21 days or something like that. Um, there was a question, was there a fatality or not? I think probably not. But 
So how far were the experiments, were they taken? Life was cheap in a way, but if you were an experimental subject, it was a gamble. <laughs> you might get better food uh, for a while, they might build you up to the level of you have the physique of being a German soldier on the one hand, but on the other hand you might also be um, the experiments were genuinely dangerous. I find interesting some of the um, low pressure experiments because the essentially what the Allies were doing in terms of experimentation and the Germans were doing was very much the same. There was a manual by this uh, Struckholt and they were doing the same sort of experiments in pressure chambers. Just that the Allied research subjects took a greater risk than the Germans did. Um, but it is very interesting. <laughs> so one can actually compare. Uh, both sides are doing human experiments. That's certainly the case. But I think the level of risk to the prisoners was far greater on the German side. And we know there were fatalities. We know there was um, permanent sterilization, um, uh, painful um, substances were used, um, and uh, certainly a lack of care on the German side. Um, I understand that there was also a considerable amount of research carried out on biological agents and chemical agents as possible vectors to be used um, as weapons um, on Russian prisoners of war. Um, was that something that got much, a lot uh, of attention at the Nuremberg trials, or were, were the people who participated in those, in that research, uh, a separate group, separate group. who were not um, included? I mean, certainly f the uses of phosgene and mustard gas were certainly much studied and prisoners was used. It does come into the medical trial proceedings. Um, there are different concentration camps, so we know a lot about the experiments in Natzweiler in Alsace, for example, um, and the um, who died. And then an interest in the dosage, which was fatal. And that provided data on what a fatal dose of phosgene should be, presumably until Bhopal and this awful Union Carbide accident. Um, but um, yeah, the, so there we have multiple sides to it. We have the interest in the dosages. That's a scientific interest to establish a so-called safe level, but using the Nazi data on those who died. And then we have the, um, um, the interest in who the victims were. Um, there's a discussions on identification. Who they were not just Russians, so, but certainly Russians were, Russian prisoners of war were vulnerable to being experimented on. That's certainly the case. Um, and the disinterest then on the Russian side in, in, in the documentation. Um, but we can, we can actually go in, we can dig in quite a lot of detail on these different subjects and who the, who the, prisoners, of, who the prisoners were. And then the, for those who survived, um, I look at compensation files, which often give a very, very detailed account of experiences. So we can we can build up a um, a picture through these different through these different autobiographical accounts of what it's like to be an experimental research subject. Um, there's a lot to do <laughs> if you're talking about thirty thousand victims. But I think that's important. Um, in my case, the research will the data will be publicly released, and it will be a research a research resource in a couple of years' time. 
by the and sustained long term. And I think that's important, and that will add to the summary data on not just the experiment, but always who the victims were, and also the perpetrators of the experiment. So I think there's, that's where the, I feel there is something that one can contribute. It could be a con an interesting contribution, um, and documenting these uh, autobiographical statements of survivors. Yes, retrospective, but still, I think um, I think important to do, because I think in any program of clinical experiments, you want to know how it felt, <laughs> in a way. So I think the the narrative. I think is important, the victim narrative. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank, uh, thank you for um, uh, your, uh, your patience while we waited for our um, speaker to arrive. Um, we had some who came from uh, Israel, um, some who came from the United Kingdom, um, but of course getting here from the Georgetown Law Center is much more difficult. <laughs> Um, if anybody knows the traffic in Washington, you understand that. Um, um, our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Professor Greg Block, um, who is a um, physician as well as a lawyer. Um, he's a professor of law here at uh, Georgetown University uh, Law Center, uh, the author of The Hippocratic Myth, Why Doctors Are Under Pressure to Ration Care, Practice Politics, and Compromise Their Promise to Heal. Um, he's nationally and internationally recognized as an expert on health law and policy. Um, his writings have appeared in a wide range of venues, including the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Health Affairs, uh, JAMA, um, as well as op-ed pieces in the Times and the Washington Post. He's a frequent commentator on um, media outlets um, and um, an excellent um, um, speaker, particularly interested in physicians and, uh, and human rights. Um, and uh, uh, Professor Block is going to talk to us um, about the Nuremberg Code um, and perhaps beyond the Nuremberg Code, some of its um, inadequacies for some of the problems that we face today. Again, trying to emphasize the connection between uh, the Nuremberg trial, the Nuremberg Code, um, and the present conditions that we face. So um, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Block to the podium. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan, for um, inviting me. And my thanks also to uh, Laura Bishop for doing the behind-the-scenes work that's essential to making this important event uh, happen. In the early weeks after 19 men hijacked four airliners and killed more than 3,000 Americans on September 11, 2001, those tasked with safeguarding America's security scrambled for answers to the challenge of obtaining information about future attacks from unwilling human sources. Within a month of the 9-11 attacks, special forces and CIA paramilitary operatives were taking prisoners in Afghanistan. Infamously, the CIA turned to a former VA clinical psychologist uh, and, to other, uh, and to physicians who devised a strategy for breaking the will of resistant detainees, a strategy that CIA staff physicians helped to design and oversee at so-called black sites around the world, a strategy that in the eyes of international law constituted torture without question. You've heard 
just by being alive and seeing the media accounts uh, of the last 20 years, especially those of you who have a little bit of gray hair, uh, you've heard some of the highlights or lowlights of this strategy, which the CIA euphemistically called enhanced interrogation. Simulated drowning, sleep deprivation for many days, forced standing until edema set in, dowsing with ice water, those are some of the things that were done. There have been, in fact, allegations that CIA physicians drew upon some of the Nazi doctors' experiments that Rabbi Steinberg discussed last night, involving specifically immersion of doomed prisoners in ice water uh, in uh, the Nazi camps. Within the CIA, some objected to the enhanced interrogation, as it was called, uh, program. Uh, they, they challenged its effectiveness at extracting intel about future attacks. They didn't so much focus on its violation of human rights. That would be a line of argument that would gain less traction. They called for study of the question of whether enhanced interrogation works, if by works what was meant is extracting actionable intelligence information. In a 2010 email, the CIA's chief of behavioral science at the time, Kirk Hubbard, told me the agency did no such study because he didn't think one could be approved. The reason? Regulations governing human subjects research done by federal agencies, including the CIA, required then, as they do now, voluntary informed consent to, quote, research involving more than min minimal risk, unquote. Uh, surely torture involves more than minimal risk. That clandestine confinement and abuse designed to reduce a prisoner to despair in order to break his will to resist, uh, don't permit voluntary consent, was understood even within the CIA. Studying torture's efficacy as an information gathering technique was against the law. The CIA held it constituted unethical human experimentation. But the torture itself, designed by doctors, was ethical and legal within the CIA. My apologies for that uh, untoward uh, ring. The federal regulations that prohibited the CIA from uh, researching torture's efficacy are known as the common rule because they govern virtually all human subjects research uh, done or funded by federal agencies. These regulations have their legal origin in the Nuremberg Code, the most enduring legacy of the 1947 Nazi doctors tribunal uh, and verdict. Uh, and I just want to show to kind of make it real uh, a, a short clip from the judgment and sentencing at uh, Nuremberg. Uh, so uh, if uh, whoever's running the uh, system can let it rip with... Uh Military Tribunal 1 has found and adjudged you guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and membership in an organization declared criminal by the judgment of the International Military Tribunal as charged under the indictment heretofore filed against you. For your said crimes on which you have been and now stand convicted, Military Tribunal 1 sentences you, Carl Brandt, to death by hanging, and may God have mercy upon your soul. The officer of the guard will remove the defendant, Brandt. Tribunal 1 has found and adjudged you guilty 
of war crimes and crimes against humanity as charged under the indictment heretofore filed against you. For your said crimes on which you have been and now stand convicted, Military Tribunal 1 sentences you, Siegfried Handloser, to imprisonment for the full term and period of your natural life to be served at such prison or prisons or other appropriate place of confinement as shall be determined by competent authority. The officer of the guard will remove the defendant hand loser. That 23 Nazi doctors went to trial, that 16 were convicted, and that 11 were sentenced to death for atrocities that defy co uh, comprehension is today less well remembered than the Nuremberg Code. Uh, set forth in the court's August 19, 1947, judgment. The Nuremberg Code was an add-on to the court's judgment, hardly essential to the judgment as a matter of legal reasoning. Um, and I'm going to uh, briefly go through part of the Nuremberg Code. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, opening, the uh, uh, preface, if you will, and you can see it for yourself, basically, uh, more or less, uh, boilerplate. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and this is the uh, first uh, paragraph, and this is the heart of the, oops, this is the heart of the uh, Nuremberg Code. Uh, the voluntary consent, certainly the most famous line in the code, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. That means that the person, this means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be so, so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice, I'm skipping ahead, and should, I'm skipping to the yellow highlighting, and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. This latter element requires that before the acceptance of an, inf of an affirmative decision by the experimental subject, there should be made known to him the nature, duration, and purpose of the experiment, the method and means by which it is to be conducted, all inconveniences and hazards reasonably to be expected, and the effects upon his health or person, and then a duty for the experimenter, the duty and responsibility for ascertaining the quality of the consent rests upon each individual who initiates, directs, or engages in the experiment. It is a personal duty and responsibility which may not be delegated to another with impunity. Next slide. And then down below the uh, fifth paragraph, no experiment should be conducted where there is an a priori reason to believe that death or disabling injury will occur, except perhaps, and this perhaps was uh, uh, something that, an, that, that the chief author, author of the code, uh, Andrew Ivey, objected to, in those experiments where the experimental physicians also serve as subjects. And this, by most accounts, was put in, this paragraph five, as a legal response uh, to something that's already been discussed, uh, the defense is bringing up as precedent uh, uh, past episodes of human experimentation uh, conducted by Americans, including Walter Reed's uh, experimentation, experiments in Cuba. Next slide. And uh, we'll, I'll skip over uh, this, uh, uh, so you, you, can, you can skim it if you'd like, uh, this is less related to the core of the code, uh, the idea of what we now call informed consent. Next slide. Um, and uh, uh, same, same uh, general theme as the immediately previous slide, obligations that the experimenter has to uh, take uh, direct account of the uh, experimental subject's uh, safety quite apart from the experimental subject's consent or lack of thereof. As Paul Weindling and others have pointed out, the research regulation scheme 
set, set forth in the, code, in the court's judgment, the scheme that only later would come to be known as the Nuremberg Code was the product of advocacy by two American physician researchers, Andrew Ivey and Leo Alexander, designated as advisors to the tribunal's judges. Of these, Ivey was likely the most influential. And dare I say, Dr. Ivey didn't think much of the tribunal to whom he was consulting. The next slide. In a 1964 letter to a British colleague, Maurice Papworth, Ivy confessed his contempt for the court, and he confessed his larger design. I might add, Ivy wrote, uh, that I accepted the invitation to serve at the Nuremberg, he didn't spell it right, tribunal, or rather trials, only because I had in mind the objective of placing in an international judicial decision, any international judicial decision, uh, the conditions upon which human beings may serve as subjects in a medical experiment, so that these conditions would become the international common law on the subject. Otherwise, I would have had nothing to do with the nasty and obnoxious business. I believe in prevention, not a, quote, punitive cure. Uh, literally, contempt of court, his own court, the court uh, to which uh, he accepted a consultative uh, gig, or from which he accepted a consultative uh, gig. Uh, the court for, for Ivy was a mere platform. He was a man with a mission that happened to intersect with the work of this tribunal, and that was his only reason for climbing aboard this uh, nasty and obnoxious business. And Ivy managed to get the essence of his, we, uh, of, of his uh, proposed, we can turn the lights back on, his proposed regulatory scheme into the doctor's trial judgment, in part by asserting without foundation that his consent-centered approach was being widely practiced. Uh, others have written in more detail about some slate of hand, that's putting it delicately, that Ivy uh, engaged in at uh, the trial itself when he testified as an expert witness. He had multiple roles. He got to testify as an expert witness and also to communicate ex parte uh, with uh, the judges. Um, and his gambit was remarkably successful. To be sure, success was not immediate. To the contrary, medical researchers largely ignored the Nuremberg Code well into the 1960s, at least in the United States. The code was for Nazis, US medical re researchers seemed to feel. America's clinical scientists were caring, well-meaning doctors who abided by Hippocratic ideals and who could be trusted who could be trusted to do, the, to do right by the research subjects. But a series of research scandals <coughs> unfolding in the 1960s and early 1970s, uh, thanks to the enterprising efforts of journalists and some academic physicians, cast rising doubt on this benign view of American clinical research. The Tuskegee syphilis outrage, black Americans denied curative antibiotic therapy for decades into the 1970s, so researchers could follow the natural history of syphilis, was perhaps the highest profile of these scandals. But there were many others. Hippocratic paternalism, it was becoming clear, was failing as a check on researchers' therapeutic and personal ambitions, and on their lapses of compassion, and on their bigotry. bigotry. So American clinical researchers and the nascent field of bioethics looked to the bookshelves and rediscovered the Nuremberg Code. It wasn't just for Nazis anymore. More precisely, they looked to the ethical heart of the Nuremberg Code, the language that I highlighted in the uh, slides, voluntary consent to human experimentation. The code's paragraph one, that's that big blotch of highlighting, its obligations to make, quote, known the nature, duration, and purpose of the experiment, the method and means by which it is to be conducted, 
all inconveniences and hazards reasonably to be expected and the effects upon his health, uh, that language was quickly distilled down to the phrase informed consent. By the mid-1970s, informed consent to clinical research had been codified in federal law in the predecessor to what became known as the common rule. By the, by the 1980s, it was quickly spreading to medical care outside the research realm. It spread to non-medical research, even to survey research, uh, and uh, even to interviews conducted by historians for the purpose of reconstructing past events or preserving historical memory. Overeager university IRBs, institutional review boards, even applied it to academics who investigated possible perpetrators of public or corporate misdeeds. Uh, law reviews and other venues ran symposium, uh, symposia on whether informed consent was running amok. In the clinical research realm, at least, and in medical care more generally, informed consent spoke to important problems. It respected patients' bodily autonomy in an era, the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when personal autonomy was rising rapidly as a cultural, political, and legal concern. It offered an alternative to Hippocratic paternalism as a safeguard for patients at a time of growing clinical specialization and bureaucracy, developments that corroded the trust and compassion built through enduring therapeutic relationships, a trust and compassion that it's a, it's a, that's at the core, I submit, of the Hippocratic Oath's architecture of protection for patients. But I submit the informed consent idea disregards the crisis of dehumanization that threatens medicine's moral center. Contempt for the humanity of victims of murder and torture, not failure to obtain consent or to accurately calculate risks and benefits, is at the core of the Nazi medical catastrophe. We know what the risks are of submerging human beings in ice water for many hours. Uh, we know what the risks are of what Dr. Mengele and his colleagues uh, did to their uh, victims. It's at the core, this contempt, of medicine's other abuses of human rights, I submit, including the CIA doctors' abuses after 9-11. And Andrew Ivey's contempt for the, quote, nasty and obnoxious business, unquote, as he put it, of doing justice, constituted, I submit, contempt for Nazi doctors' victims. He used the apparatus of justice as a platform for his own ambition, a disturbing parallel an ironic parallel to some medical researchers' pursuit of their ambitions even today at their patients, at their patient subjects' expense. Stepping back from this a bit, the Nazis contorted bioethical language in, into a means for debasing those who they blamed, resented, or otherwise loathed. And that, I submit, is closer to the core of the Nazis' abuse of uh, medicine. The Nazis borrowed from American bigots of the early 20th century to do this. Men whose names some of you may know, perhaps know well, men like Madison Grant, Harry Laughlin, and Lothrop Stoddard, who wielded clinical language uh, to purvey their racial contempt. Uh, men who were celebrities, uh, popular figures uh, in their own day. Goebbels called Nazism, quote, applied biology, unquote. Lawyers for Karl Brandt, Adolf Hitler's personal physician, introduced excerpts from Madison Grant's American bestseller, which went through four editions in the United States from the late teens uh, th through the early 30s, uh, the passing of the great race. Lawyers for Brandt submitted these excerpts at the doctor's trial. And Hitler himself borrowed language from Grant's book for Mein Kampf, then sent Grant a thank you note praising Grant's book as, quote, my Bible, unquote. In July 1941, 
Hitler proclaimed, quote, I feel like I am Robert Koch in politics. He discovered the bacillus and thereby ushered medical science onto new paths. I discovered the Jew as the bacillus and fermenting agent of all social decomposition. German doctors seized upon this opportunity to champion their nation's public health, as many of them saw it. So their enthusiasm for Nazism is hardly surprising. Um, and so I dare submit, as regards to Nazi medicine and its atrocity crimes and the causes uh, uh, of Nazi medicine's involvement uh, in uh, atrocity, Andrew Ivey and the Nuremberg Code missed by a mile. This catastrophe can't be, tra can't be traced to failure to seek voluntary consent. It's the bigotry. Uh, I remember it's the economy stupid from the Clinton campaign. Well, it's the bigotry stupid given sinew by the language of science. And it's the rendering of people as subhuman that bigotry breeds. In less extreme form, dehumanization has engendered myriad abuses, past and present, in America, from the time of human enslavement uh, to uh, the present, I dare say, to some of the uh, health and medical care disparities of uh, the present in America. Bigotry brought about the dehumanization that yielded Tuskegee. Class and race differences, researchers' ambition, and the reality that doctors and patients increasingly encounter each other as strangers in moments of health and life crisis corrode human connection with patients, whether or not research is part of the clinical transaction. Add in physicians and clinics and hospitals' financial incentives today and patients' awareness of those incentives. And the toxic brew of further dehumanization is made nastier and more widespread. The Nuremberg Code did make a seminal contribution by introducing consent into the doctor-patient relation on a widespread basis. But consent is not enough. We need to find a way back to humane physician-patient connection, something that at, in the, our time of unprecedented medical specialization and bureaucracy is going to be really, really hard. Thank you very much. And happy, happy to do any Q&A, discussion, uh, challenges to what I've set forth here. Uh, let's roll. I assume, I assume the Western world had adopted uh, the Nuremberg Code. What about the Soviet bloc? Uh, great question. Actually, during the time of the uh, Soviet Union, there was a uh, countervailing uh, Soviet physician's uh, uh, ethical code and oath, which uh, emphasized, uh, not surprisingly, the physician's duty to society, to the group, uh, and uh, de-emphasized Hippocratic language about the physician's commitment to uh, individuals. Um, and, uh, and did sound some of the same notes that the Weimar Republic era uh, code of ethics for German physicians uh, sounded about public health. Language that could, divorced from historical context, sound, dare I say it, rather progressive. We all favor public health, or at least uh, most of us do. This is the era of Ron DeSantis, after all. Uh, but uh, uh, um, when you put it into context when the Jew becomes the bacillus, when uh, the black person becomes the threat, uh, when human beings become agents of disease in this metaphor of public health, it becomes really easy to flip this uh, from uh, standing up for the well-being of people into the ugliest kind of uh, brutality. So, so, th so uh, yeah, the Soviet Union gave uh, lip service to a whole lot that went down at the Nuremberg Tribunals more generally. But as a practical matter, there was a very different ideal that 
uh, Soviet doctors pursued. Uh, the story of Soviet psychiatry, which I've written about, but which I won't, I won't plunge into it here, uh, illustrates, I think, uh, uh, some of the risks that a more public health sounding code of ethics can pose when you flip the historical context uh, into, uh, the, into, into that of the early and mid 20th century totalitarian regimes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I particularly appreciated your uh, conclusion. That is that the uh, real problem of, uh, uh, of the Nazi experimentation was not uh, necessarily the fact that uh, uh, experimentees uh, were not able to consent to research, but in fact a dehumanizing nature of that research. In light of that, I wonder why is it that the notion of uh, do no harm, what we call the principle of non-maleficence, did not receive at the time in the mind of, the, uh, of, the, of those who drafted the, uh, the code uh, the kind of importance, the kind of place that it obviously ought to have in light of what you're saying? I think that's a profoundly important question that you pose. Uh, we have Dr. Ivey's uh, own testimony to this in the form of, I put testimony in quotes here, since he also literally testified at the uh, uh, Nuremberg uh, Doctors' Tribunal. Uh, his testimony to us, uh, the message he left us in that 1964 uh, letter uh, to his uh, friend and colleague. He was intent on the consent principle. He was looking for a way to uh, spread the consent principle, to disseminate the consent principle. And he saw this opportunity, uh, the fact that there was going to be a trial of Nazi doctors as a way of spreading it. So I think it's really important to underscore that the Nuremberg Code was uh, not a response to specifically to uh, Nazi doctors, but was rather a, uh, uh, the seizing of opportunity by uh, Dr. Ivey, uh, and perhaps by Leo Alexander as well. I have less of a sense of his history. Uh, uh, to uh, disseminate this particular ethical vision. I should point out, there was another uh, model uh, out there, uh, as some of you may know, an eminent uh, uh, researcher at UCSF Medical School named uh, Otto uh, Gutentag uh, proposed the idea, uh, proposed a very different approach to managing the challenge of physician researchers' role conflict. And that, I submit, is what's really going on. You've got a role conflict here, right? You have a commitment to patients, but you also have a commitment to, to the science, if you want to put it in its more positive light, uh, a countervailing ambition to become great as a researcher, if you want to look at you know, the other dimensions of human motivation. So Gutentag came up with the idea, how about for each experimental situation, let's have two physicians involved, the physician researcher and uh, uh, someone who he called the physician friend. That, of course, would have been more complicated, more unwieldy, and certainly more costly to manage. Um, and uh, American medical research did not adopt the physician friend model for safeguards the as a safeguard. The physician friend model would have gone closer to the direction that you're speaking to. Uh, hi. Um, was there ever any discussion about the experimentation that involved non-physicians, individuals who may have had an advanced degree or a scientist who may have wanted to do the experiment, uh, and how were they looked at in respect to being covered by the Nuremberg Code? You're speaking of in more contemporary times, or I'm or speaking the time of, of the back Nazis? then and now. Well, I'm, so you raise a really interesting question: To what degree were others with advanced uh, training who were not physicians uh, involved in? Uh, the Nazi uh, medical experiments. I don't know the answer to that question. What I do know about the German tradition is that physicians held even more kind of pride of place in the scheme than they do in this country. In this country, physicians are 
um, you know, kings of the hill when it comes to medical research to the point that lots of people enter MD, PhD programs rather than just PhD programs just to make sure that they have that, you know, extra, you know, bar on their uniform sleeve. Uh, but, uh, uh, but they're not dominant. In Germany at that time, uh, physicians were even more dom dominant. So I don't know the answer to your question as regards to them, uh, uh, but I suspect the physicians were kind of the, the, the players who uh, ran uh, the show. It certainly seems that way from the investigative efforts of uh, the Nuremberg Tribunals. I'm wondering, okay, there we go. It's on, okay. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, it, you've certainly demonstrated that the Nuremberg Code uh, has a questionable legacy. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any codes that are, that, whose focus is on biomedical research, whose impact you find to be laudable, that actually are functioning well that are not as questionable as your interpretation of the Nuremberg Code's legacy? Yeah, I, I guess I should clarify one thing. And I realize that when one gives a talk like this, there's inevitably a process of simplification that can, um, you know, you know that, that can leave out stuff. Uh, and I, I do want to underscore that I think the Nuremberg Code contributed a lot, that especially at a time of, dare I say, anomie, in relations between doctors and patients, anomie that has arisen in part because of positive developments, like scientific advance that has required specialization uh, in order to uh, play out clinically, especially uh, in such a time. Uh, the consent principle is enormously valuable. The paternalism principle uh, that underg undergirds the Hippocratic Oath has its limits. And I say paternalism in the best light here. You can say maternalism as well. Uh, uh, has its limits when it comes to uh, the estrangement that today exists between uh, physicians uh, and patients. Uh, uh, I don't know when it comes to the dehumanization piece, when it comes to the uh, doctors and patients meeting as strangers piece. I don't know that a code of ethics can solve uh, the problem. There certainly have been efforts to push back in the form of more modernized versions of the Hippocratic uh, Oath, but what do we do about the reality of the conditions under which physicians do their clinical work? Uh, the notion of professional code, codes of ethics uh, risks presupposing uh, a world of doctors acting individually uh, without their environments being shaped by outside institutions, by outside uh, forces. That might have been an unrealistic premise about the world, even when doctors rode horseback uh, to country ho houses and pulled out black bags once they got off their horses and went and did pr procedures on the kitchen table uh, uh, while patients bit the bullet, literally. Um, it's certainly unrealistic today for any physician in practice who knows all the bureaucratic and financial and other pressures in operation. I think the future has to be one of looking at the institutional context of medical work and ensuring that mechanisms of governance preserve more space for uh, physician uh, autonomy in the best sense, uh, autonomy uh, when it comes to uh, issues of role conflict uh, than uh, uh, exist today. That's a, lo that's a long conversation, much longer than we can afford right now. So there's, there's a lot of, of conversation currently in the medical research community around the ideas of learning health systems and comparative effectiveness right. research. And part of that conversation involves notions of an obligation to participate in research because uh, currently we benefit from the contributions of earlier uh, studies. And secondly, notions of studies of standards of 
comparing standards of care where the argument is made that the practicality of obtaining consent uh, is, is such that uh, people want to do these comparative effectiveness studies um, and, and waive informed consent. Um, can you comment on, on your views about, about that conversation? Well, I think uh, for, for me to uh, you know, think it through in more detail, I'd have to uh, be looking at, specific, at particular scenarios. But I would say this, when it comes, say, to data that have been collected by uh, EMR, electronic medical records, and when it comes to looking back uh, uh, electronically at that data, in general, I'd be supportive of uh, freedom to do so for the purpose of improving medical care, developing standards, going back and doing basically a much more sophisticated kind of retrospective study. Uh, uh, but the key is, and here this is way beyond, beyond my bellywork, the key is preservation of people's privacy through de-identification. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't know in the era of, say, quantum computing uh, on the horizon whether we can be confident that that preservation is even possible. This goes way, way, way beyond my expertise. Uh, but uh, it becomes critical that we marshal at least the same kind of protection of privacy that we have marshaled pretty successfully for the preservation of our financial information uh, in order to proceed in that direction. If we, if we can accomplish that, and de -ident along with de-identification, then in generally I'd be uh, uh, a strong supporter. Yeah, no, uh, I'm, I'm talking about a, a different kind of research. I'm talking about random assignment clinical trials of people, for example, uh, who have sepsis, right? And you have to make decisions about uh, how quickly to administer, um, uh, um, right? Um, I've heard about some of this with, and you make, when it comes to artificial blood, artificial yeah, blood products. And, and you're making decisions about uh, wanting to do studies in which you randomly assign people to different treatments that are all considered to be within the standard of care in order to ascertain whether one way, whether uh, administering uh, the, the liquids is more or less um, effective. That and, and the argument made yeah. that we want to put people in studies and that we can't get, or, uh, that we can't get consent to randomly assign them to one version of standard of care treatment versus another. I think it's, in, in general, uh, that's uh, a recipe for the brewing of uh, a stew of distrust. I think that uh, part of the calculus when we consider these questions needs to be the reality of how these matters are going to be reported, uh, presented uh, to the public, and judged by uh, the public. And it may be, you know, certainly in the eyes of some of the researchers doing this, there may be genuine empirically based equipoise. Uh, and in an ethical sense, that equipoise may in the eyes of researchers doing this work, uh, justify this kind of randomization. But think about how it's going to get seen in the public eye uh, when enterprising reporters come along, uh, uh, when matters are leaked, uh, et cetera. Anything that you kind of don't want, you know, plastered across uh, CNN, or well, how about Fox News or MSNBC? Uh, uh, anything that you uh, worry about being plastered you know, across the chirons of those sorts of venues is something that's kind of high risk. Uh, whether we call this a matter of ethics or not, I think human perception matters a lot because it speaks to human trust. Uh, and as physicians have understood for a couple thousand years, one of the principal functions of medical ethics is to sustain that trust. So I worry a lot about uh, the kind of randomization that you uh, uh, are speaking of. Uh, unless, may maybe there's a few rare cases where you have somebody in an emergency room uh, and you have true equipose. Uh, 
uh, and it's not possible to engage in a conversation about this. So I wouldn't say never, never, but I worry a lot about it. Um, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm wondering whether I can spark a little conversation back with uh, Professor Weindling, and it's over the relationship between um, law and ethics within the trial. And I don't know how much of it is uh, perhaps uh, what I detect a, a difference in your presentations um, with respect to the history, or how much of it is a um, difference of an opinion of jurisprudence and the sort of relationship of law and, uh, and ethics. But um, uh, but it seems to me that um, uh, Professor Weindling was suggesting that the um, the ethical aspects were sort of central um, to the uh, to the legal proceedings of the uh, courtroom, and your presentation suggested it was more of an uh, add-on at the end or a, a pet project of one um, American scientist who wanted to sort of hijack the proceedings for another uh, another purpose. And I wonder if um, you. Um, uh, what you have to say about that, and perhaps what Professor Weindling would have to say about that. So. Well, uh, uh, go, go ahead. Let, let, uh. and I, I apologize for mispronouncing your name no. when I uh, <coughs> invoked it uh, before. Um, I feel that there is a, a complementarity between our two presentations. I looked more at the um, I can say, Ivy's role before the trial, he came with an agenda. He'd already enunciated a sort of uh, proto code in um, uh, July uh, 1946 at the Pasteur Institute. We see that everything is there apart from patient autonomy and the right to simply to break off being in an experiment, which the judges then added in. But there was a lot of interaction between Ivy and the, um, and the tribunal, and Ivy and others at the trial. Um, but I don't think that there is a inconsistency between our, our views, really. Um, Ivy, I uh, have a more positive view of Ivy. One has to balance um, Ivy as perjuring himself about with the Green Committee on the penitentiary experiments and the, um, I can say, the pushback from the German defense that penitentiary experiments are equivalent to concentration camp experiments. Um, they're, in fact, very different in the management. But um, I, I, I hadn't said anything until now, but I didn't feel we have a, that there's any fundamental difference in our presentations. Uh, that was, that's my perception. And you're one of the world's leading experts on not just this tribunal, but the process that led up to it. And sure. I've uh, drawn upon uh, your work in formulating uh, my own thinking about this. Uh, and so I have to, you know, I, I defer to you gladly with respect to uh, that history. I mean, all, all, all folks' motives are complicated, even ours. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think perhaps I was being a little bit too flip in my, you know, depiction uh, of him. That he was an ambitious guy uh, would seem without question from the history, but in critical ways he put that ambition to public use. He did not later on in his career. As some of you may know, he was indicted uh, and then acquitted only after a trial lasting many months. Uh, for the peddling of a uh, useless uh, purported anti-cancer uh, drug. Uh, and uh, he, he, when he passed, it was more or less in disgrace. His New York Times obituary uh, presents him as newsworthy 
because he was a, an infamous promoter of a worthless uh, anti-cancer uh, 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 drug. Perhaps uh, President Trump would be appreciative today of uh, uh, Dr. Ivey. So he has a checkered history. Yes, uh, no, I, uh, I mean, I absolutely agree with that. There's, um, um, the, the, there are dark sides to Ivey, but nonetheless, the vision that he had of a of re uh, of putting medicine on a an ethical and humane basis in making physicians uh, how can I say he he is putting obligations on physicians to in the conduct of experiments he is trying at the same time to justify animal experiments as the a necessary preliminary stage. So there's a sort of duality with Ivy, yeah. where he is on the one hand trying to, um, to make medical procedures more humane, more patient-oriented. Um, Krebison, this undoubtedly fake can cancer therapy, the only advantage was, was it was meant to be universally effective and painless. So, ideally, it was a. I mean, he was. It is a very unfortunate blot on his um, on his scientific reputation.